everyone. Welcome to Sama Saturday. We love so much coming together with all of you every weekend, 10 a.m. Pacific time here on Sama Dog. Um, I'm Amanda Ree. I'm the founder of Sama Dog, and we're here one Saturday a month, the second Saturday of every month, with my dear friend and the amazing, wise woman, the healer herself, Dr. Katie Kangas. She is a local veterinarian here in San Diego. Many of you likely know her already or have seen her on some of these other shows or have participated in a webinar that we've been doing together. Dr. Kangas has been so extraordinary with all of her graciousness and her time and her knowledge and support for all of us and for Sama Doc. So we wanna kick it off with thanking and welcoming Dr. Kangas. Thank you for the gracious welcome and introduction. As always, Amanda, it's my pleasure to be here. And my pleasure to share any information uh, that people can utilize to improve the health and well-being of their pets and themselves. And so rewarding for me that I get to, uh, with all the, the teaching and the sharing that I do and that we do together, that uh, not only do lots of pets get to benefit, but their human counterparts that love them as well. So, so much of the information we share is so valuable amongst all species. So it's really, really rewarding for me to be involved in, in sharing that. So thank you so much for giving me such a great opportunity to do so. Oh, you're so welcome. And that's Dharma, baby, as they yeah. say, Dharma, your purpose and watching you and participating and partnering with you to be able to share my Dharma and unite them together is exceptional. So yeah. that's what we're doing today, sharing more. And what we are kind of the way we're framing today's session is just an open Q&A. Many times um, you'll you all, our audience will send questions through or um we also have a course going right now, which you may have heard about. It's called Total Wellbeing for Dogs. It's a six week online course and we're in week five. So where we've been so far throughout this course, just to kind of touch on it and let you all know, because many of the students are here um, and we'll be rewatching the recording as well. And I fielded some of their questions. So in the six weeks, what we go over together is Ayurveda and doshas as that first week. The second week we get into nutrition, canine nutrition, and that's where Dr. Kangas led us in that and taught an awesome session. Then we get into training and care routines, then over to balancing through the senses where we really learn to awaken our animal's inner pharmacy. Then we came this um, last week into um, emotions and communication, and we had, were joined by a wonderful animal communicator. And then in our last um, session, this next week will be spirituality and energy work. So really learning to recognize dogs, animals as our teachers and as our soul friends. And this course has been extraordinary. We've got a great group of people, and I know many of them will, like I said, be watching or have sent their questions in to be able to reconnect with Dr. Kangas because um, they loved and enjoyed her so much. So we wanted to open this up not only to our classmates, but also <laughs> my friend just wrote a very funny comment in. <laughs> she said sex pot. <laughs> it must be the hot pink, baby. <laughs> but um, but um, anyways, not only for our group of our um, students to be able to participate, but wanted to put it on our public page so everyone can participate and get some knowledge from Dr. Kangas. So let's just dive right into it. Let's say hello to our friends. Christine's there. I love to see you living your dharma. We were just talking about that before we pressed play. Uh, <laughs> um, Lipreet, hi, sweetie. Hi, Lola. And uh, Rena's here. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Yay! So we're friends on the line. Yeah, so let us know if you're watching. Um, just give us a comment below or a reaction. We'd love to see your little hearts and and uh, thumbs up and whatnot. And then, of course, if you have other people in your community that have animals and would like to live holistically with them, which most of you certainly do, because that's the kind of people you are, then please share this out there. We'd love to connect to as many hearts and lives as possible. All right, so let's get into some. And if you guys have questions um, that come up, put them in. That's what this is all about. So we'll come back to them. I'll just start with a couple of the um, sent in questions. So this one comes in from Jill, one of our students, and she says, my dog Faith, who is a 12-year-old German Shepherd, has been licking the ground and dirt a lot recently. 
I've been told this is a sign of mineral defic deficiency. She's on a raw diet and I've been supplementing with trace mineral supplement, but I'm thinking I may need to do something different. I've been considering and getting the kelp product that Dr. Kangas recommended, but also a trace mineral capsule has been recommended to me to use as well. Comparing the kelp and the synthetic supplement, which do you feel would be better for the body to absorb and be more effective at addressing a mineral deficiency? Uh, that's a great question. I definitely am a fan of kelp as uh, sounds like with, uh, this person was already aware. Uh, and it is a, a definitely an issue that I see a lot where we do know that a lot of humans and animals now are mineral deficient or trace mineral deficient, especially. And those are minerals such as magnesium and zinc and selenium and iodine. And kelp, because our soils are so depleted now, that, that's why most of us are deficient in these minerals, because the foods that we are eating are not as, uh, do not contain the same concentrations of these minerals that they used to uh, before, you know, our soils were, were so depleted that they are now. And so kelp is one of the best places to get trace minerals from because the ocean still is very, in fact, much more concentrated with minerals than, uh, you know, than land soil ever was. Uh, so kelp is, is definitely a good choice. I am almost always a fan of natural whole food ingredients over a synthetic supplement. So I would, to answer that question directly, I would lean towards using the kelp or the whole supplement rather than a specific synthetic. But, you know, that said, there may be some situations where if magnesium is the one thing that's, you know, really missing for a certain individual, a, a human or a, an animal, that a magnesium supplement added to that may be, you know, appropriate and, and just fine to do. So, um, you know, there could be mineral analysis testing done. So you may want to actually do that. That is something that I look at. I don't do that testing frequently, but that is something that I look at with any patients that are licking the dirt, the ground, metal, eating strange objects, things like that. So that would be uh, something that I would recommend to look into, maybe do some blood work or some other uh, analysis testing just to to look into that a little further and find out what the potential cause may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. I will notice that with our pups too, occasionally like licking of weird things like the couch, you know, natural fibers typically, and you can see that like something's a little off there. So that's great. Thank you. We have one that came in here from Suzanne, and I'll just kind of go randomly through some questions. Do you see many dogs with heartworm in your practice? How often do you recommend testing if not, uh, if not on a preventative? Great question, Suzanne. The awesome thing is, and I'm not sure if everybody tuning in, you know, is from all kinds of different areas around the country or even globally, but where we are in Southern California, where my practice is in San Diego, luckily, fortunately, I don't see heartworm disease. Um, I can tell you I've been in San Diego practicing as a veterinarian for almost 22 years. I'm from the Midwest though, originally, and then I practiced in Virginia for a short time between Wisconsin and uh, California. And in other areas of the country, heartworm disease is much more prevalent because it is transmitted by mosquitoes. So um, luckily in Southern California, we have very minimal mosquitoes. And so we don't see a lot of heartworm disease. The risk is not zero, but it is extremely, extremely low. There's a, there's some reported cases here and there, but I can tell you in over 20 years of living here, I have never diagnosed a heartworm positive dog that lived in San Diego. Wow. I used to work, yeah, so pretty, pretty wonderful odds there. I used to work um, in the shelter system and we would see dogs come in from, you know, Mississippi, Katrina Rescue in Louisiana and places like that for, uh, certain rescue, you know, missions, and those dogs may have, you know, have had heartworm, but dogs that live here locally, not so. So mm -hmm. I still do not, uh, I still, I encourage people to go with their comfort level, but I actually don't use heartworm prevention for my dog. And I encourage people, did you hear my dog? She's, she's, she's sharing her excitement about that as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, mom. Thank you. Our, That's what she's saying. Right. Our neighbors came over. 
Uh, so I still don't use heartworm prevention for my dog. And most of the people who come to me, most of my clients do not use for, for their dogs, but several of my clients do. I mean, a, a portion of my clients certainly do. And my recommendations are if you stay, if you're staying in this area with your dog, I feel comfortable not using heartworm prevention. I do recommend annual testing and annual testing should be enough. You could do every six months if you want to be even more conscientious the tests these days uh, test for antigen, not for the little uh, microfilaria larvae in the bloodstream. So the antigen is created once the adult worms are uh, present. Uh, so if so, basically what I wanted to um, relay is that annual testing it takes a long time for the life cycle to actually get to the point where the um, test is coming up positive. So testing frequently is a good idea and annual testing you will catch the disease before it becomes advanced so it's still uh, very beneficial to do so mm -hmm. uh, my clients that do travel to places that have a higher level or, or population of mosquito exposure then that would be times that i would recommend to consider using heartworm prevention uh, or obviously if you live in places that are endemic with a lot of mosquitoes. So okay. um, that would be, and it also can be used, it doesn't have to be used year round or every single month in order to be effective. Mm -hmm. So if you travel at certain points of the year to areas that have uh, more uh, risk of mosquito. The, the UPS man just came. No <laughs> and on D Live, you can't mute. Yeah. So I'm yeah. sorry, everyone. It'll only be a moment. You thought you thought Sage was bad. Right. Hey, hey Graham. That's enough. Good Thank boy, you. Graham. Good boy, buddy. Good boy. He actually listened. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so just to just to recap, the heartworm prevention is given monthly. It does not have to be given every single month continuously in order for it to still be effective at times that you need it. So it is possible for people to use those products as needed in times of the year where they are going to be uh, having their dogs in a higher exposure area. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good to know. And it um, brings my mind to a question I actually meant to ask you, and a few um, people have brought it to my mind, is on the news recently in San Diego, I don't know if you heard about this, but they did this whole feature on that um, heartworm is worse now in San Diego than ever. And when I went into the more conventional vet the other day to help somebody with their dog, there was this whole campaign where they even had these sunglasses that are like heart shaped for pets, for dogs. And it was all about heartworm. And you could see that there was like marketing behind this. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you knew anything about that, first of all, and is that true? Are they getting worse in San Diego? You know, that's a good question. I, I, I have not seen that clinically. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I see, you know, numerous, numerous, uh, you know, dogs that obviously have a general practitioner as well. And then me for the, you know, more holistic complementary medicine. Uh, but, I, you know, so, so these are, these are dogs that are all over the area and people that drive to me from, uh, you know, distant areas too, to come to me. And I, I have no patients that are heartworm positive, none. Mm -hmm. So uh, I haven't seen the increased incidence from my clinical uh, perspective, but I have heard reports also that incidence is higher than it used to be. However, it's still very, very low compared to, you know, so I still think with my uh, perspective and what I've seen clinically that the, if, you're, if your dogs are staying in this area, that the risk of using, you know, chemicals and pesticides each month outweighs the risk of the heartworm exposure. But, but that is not the case in other areas of the country. But where we are, we're fortunate that we can be a little more choosy about using the prevention products. That's great. Thank goodness. Yeah. So, you know, always a good thing. Okay. So we have a question that came in from Shannon. Actually, Trish wrote it in, but this is Shannon's question. Um, I have a diabetic pup who is 15 to 16 years old who had been on 12 units of humulin 
two times a day for about eight years. Recently, the amount needed has steadily been decreasing and now am down to three units. Vet can't give me a reason other than it happens. Other thoughts on what could be going on in the body? Wow, that's great. So cumulin is a type of insulin and that's a long time uh, to you know be on insulin. So great for your doggy that uh, he's doing so well. Um, you know, as far as the insulin requirement being decreased, that's a great question. I haven't managed a, a large number of diabetic dogs for, for that amount of time, for that many years. Uh, and the body does change, though, as it ages. My first inclination might be that maybe you've changed the diet along the way. Um, there's definitely a lot of shifting notions about how dogs or human diabetics should have been, you know, should be eating, the thoughts on that have changed quite a bit. So I'm not sure if you've changed the diet. Uh, we used to put diabetic dogs on, you know, high fiber, uh, carbohydrate diets. And then of course, a lot of the nutrition um, education has changed to where, you know, carbohydrates obviously are going to, you know, drive the sugars and insulin and things. And so eating less carbohydrates can actually be, and obviously sugars can actually be very advantageous. So if you've changed the diet to uh, complement that, and a lot of times I, you know, really uh, recommend for the most part kind of ketogenic type diets, or at least modified ketogenic diets that are low in carbs and higher in, in fat as an energy source. So if something similar to that may have been done for your doggy's diet, that could definitely explain uh, the reason for the decreased insulin needs or at least lending to that picture. Part of it may be, you know, other things going on in the body. If other health parameters are changing or improving, there may be something that's just changing in the body with age too. But that's fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Less insulin needed and the fact that your doggy's doing well after years of managing diabetes is fantastic. So kudos to you for that. And I'm really, really happy for your doggy. Mm -hmm. Me too. And maybe also, I think that came from Suzanne, right? Um, maybe Suzanne, if that's correct. Um, oh no, Shannon. Shannon wrote that in. So maybe also it is the, all the other work that you're doing as far as the holistic approach, energy, being mindful of your own wellness, um, the environment that your dog is staying in every day. I mean, everything that we've shared through the class and through Sama Dog and through all of the conversations with Dr. Kangas, if you're really bringing all of this into your life, I mean, that's the whole idea. That's the big idea is that we'll be able to see an improvement in any health condition and in overall wellness. So it looks like it's working. <laughs> so I want to just pause here and welcome everyone to the line, give you a little update what's going on. So this is Dr. Katie Kangas. As you may know, we are live with the Holistic Vet today, and we're just getting all of our questions answered. So if you have any questions that have come along the way, uh, now's your chance. Has something kind of been going on with your pet or some information that you've received that you're not sure if that's what you should be following or whatever it may be? please don't hesitate. So I wanted to say hello to Leslie Ann. She's on with us and Suzanne and Susan from Massachusetts. Hey guys with Buster. <laughs> and there's my friend Cindy with all of her dogs on the line. Sharon or Shannon Fisher. Hi there. Good to have you with us too. And here's somebody else coming in from Florida. So great to have you guys here. Let us know again, if you have any questions that come up, just type them in below and we'll keep coming back to them. So we had one here about kitties. Let me go down to that from Trish. Here we go. Any natural tips for regulating cats with diabetes? We are testing for acromulge. You would, I don't know those words. <laughs> I am not the vet. <laughs> Can you see it up there, Dr. Kangas? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, I just, let me just, can you still see me? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Sorry, I lost my screen for a second. Let me. <laughs> okay, sorry. Let's see. Oh, okay, sorry. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay, okay. So now I can. Um, okay, so, uh, Natural tips for regulating kitties with diabetes. Um, again, I 
I would definitely discuss diet. So dry food is is one of you know the first things that I would address because dry food is you know lending to many many disease problems uh, across the board. But definitely for kitties, kitties are very sensitive to being on foods that are devoid of moisture. And it's not natural for any species to be eating food that is, you know, completely desiccated. Uh, but it definitely is lending to issues with kitties and diabetes is on the list. Most people may know that cats get a lot of bladder problems and kidney problems. And that dry food has been, you know, one of the culprits that we really think is lending to those problems, but also to diabetes. So if your kitty is eating dry food, that's one of the first things that I would change is getting to more of a natural diet. And moisture rich is the first thing you want to do. So quality canned foods is definitely an option. Raw food would be even better for the majority of, you know, patients if they like it and tolerate it. Canned food is still processed, but the moisture rich component is absolutely essential. Uh, there was a internal medicine specialist in the San Diego area who one of her areas of expertise was diabetes and pancreatitis. And she definitely um, educated on the fact that dry food is one of the first, you know, or the big things that lent to both of those issues. So that's one thing that I would definitely um, support doing as a, as a dietary change if that hasn't been done already. There's also, I work a lot with uh, food nutrition supplements because again, food medicine is, is my big, uh, you know, initial approach and standard process actually makes supplements that uh, help pancreatic function. And there's one called pancreatrophin PMG that I use a lot. And it's in a tablet form. It's a very small tablet. And, uh, and again, it's food medicine. So it's easy to most often easy to put in a cat's food and have them accept that because it does not taste bad. Uh, it's not herbal, like, you know, some of the uh, natural things that we could use. Uh, and so that would be one of the things that I would recommend uh, for most diabetic patients too. Mm -hmm. That's great. And Standard Process in general <clears throat> is just such a great brand, such a great formulation of potent um, supplements. Yeah, very, very effective and food medicine. So mm -hmm. really great okay. things to do. Mm, it's great. So yeah, here's... Oh, yeah, cool. and actually, sorry, the other thing I just thought of that I would also do in that situation is support the liver. So liver support is, you know, very important in any kind of chronic disease, but definitely uh, diabetes as well. So I would generally be putting things on. Uh, oh, and the other thing, actually, I'm sorry, just thinking as I'm talking here, um, digestive enzymes is another really important thing to do to, uh, you know, give the pancreas some support because obviously the pancreas is very involved in uh, diabetes uh, disease, you know, syndrome. And so supporting the pancreas with digestive enzymes and with some food nutrition supplements that are possible like pancreatrophin uh, and then also liver support. And liver support can be done with also food medicine, standard process makes feline hepatic support, which would be a really good choice. And then I also have a liquid uh, herbal supplement that I use a lot called liver defense, which is available over the counter. That's an animal essentials uh, brand product. And that is just milk thistle and dandelion. And that's excellent liver support too. So those would both, or those um, all combined would be wonderful options and choices to do. Mm, those are great. I love it when you tell us about stuff like that because those those are the great ones. And and when you actually even see them at the stores, sometimes you're not sure. You know, you can tell that this is a good line. Um, animal Essentials is such a Animal Essentials is that what it's yeah Animal Essentials yeah, yeah it's such a great brand also. But sometimes I'm not sure. You know, why do you go to which ones for what? So that's mm -hmm. super informative. Thank you. And then sure. And then digestive enzymes can you know. There's lots of different, uh, you know, products out there, different company lines that do digestive enzymes for pets and Animal Essentials does one as well. Uh, Mercola has a good one and, mm -hmm. you know, many, many options out there, but that will also help pancreatic function and take a little bit of load off the, the work of the pancreas. So that's also a, a beneficial thing that could be done. Awesome. This is a sweet comment here from Tina, one of our students. So grateful for sharing your time and knowledge and your collaboration with Amanda. Thank, Thank you, you, Tina. You've been so wonderful in this course with us. And so many others are jumping on with us. Here's Kate. Um, we've got 
all the little bits and pieces. Yeah, it's great. Someone in, coming in from Holland. She says she can't see us very well, but maybe it's a little internet disconnect there. But I, it's coming in clear on this end, so I think we're okay. Um, I did have another question that came in, speaking of Europe. Uh, someone, and this was really interesting to me, so I'll read you this one. Um, this is from Helen. She said, I'm from Europe and never had I ever heard or even seen a dog who had anal gland issues that needed expressing by human intervention. What's this all about? Oh, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> anal glands, <laughs> that's cute. It is. <laughs> Oops. Oh, just as oh. I said. Oh, there we go. Just as I said, we weren't having internet problems. Okay, Apparently, okay. Well, that's good. You jumped back on easy. Please go that ahead. Was, that was short. Yeah, <laughs> good. Uh, anal glands are these glands that sit right inside the anus or the rectum uh, at about 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. And their role, I mean, they, they collect, uh, you know, anal gland secretion in there and it can be stored in there. They can get, they can, uh, be an issue for some dogs and not an issue for other dogs at all. And they can cause intermittent, you know, problems. They basically, they get full or dogs will excrete them. And they have a very, very uh, distinct and horrific odor. Oh, it's the one that even <laughs> um, thinking of it gives people, me Yeah, people will relate it to, you know, either stinky fish or, or garbage or, you know, just really, really awful smell. Uh, some dogs will ex will excrete them on their own. Generally, the pattern would be if they get excited or, uh, you know, challenged and, you know, with stress or something like that in a fight or excitement, they may be excreted. That's kind of evolutionarily what we think, you know, happens. Um, with our dogs, you know, oftentimes if they do need to be expressed, they may need to be expressed uh, regularly, which a lot of groomers actually do. And then there's other dogs that never need them expressed at all. So it's such a variable issue. I have seen in a lot of my patients that anal gland issues tend to be more associated with allergies actually. So if you have a dog that has allergies and is oftentimes itchy, they may have more anal gland issues, but that's not you know a, a vast, uh, generalization, but definitely I've seen that as a typical trend. So mm -hmm. allergic dogs may need more anal gland um, expression or attention. And the other thing that we do think is that when there's more fiber in the diet and perhaps with pets on raw food diets where there's ground bone, that that can help naturally for the anal glands to excrete on their own without ha needing to be expressed. OK, so when we do express anal glands, uh, you go in there, you know, with a gloved finger. And, and like I said, groomers can do this or vets can do this or some people even do this for their own dogs. And if they're full, they can be expressed. If they're empty, great. Then, you know, they don't need any attention. Uh, sometimes they can get infections of the anal glands and they can actually abscess, too. So there are an occasional uh, you know, situation where they need to be treated you know, medically with either flushing out the anal glands or a lot of veterinarians may use antibiotics in that situation. And then there are dogs that actually have enough chronic issues with anal glands that surgery is recommended to surgically remove them. Mm -hmm. So that isn't needed often, but there are certainly dogs that have had that procedure done. So can I've, kind of really go across the gamut. I've heard of a homeopathic that supports anal gland issues. Have you ever used that or know of it? No, actually, I don't have experience with that product. I was wondering. Okay, yeah. and any idea of why, because I've heard that before from people overseas and coming from other countries and things, that they have had dogs their whole life and they've never heard of such a thing until they got here. Do you think it's just part of our, our, our food creation process for these animals? That is a really great question because I did not realize that it wasn't as much of a prevalence globally as it is here. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. You would think diet would have to be one of the most likely uh, components in that, but um, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. That's a good mm -hmm. question. The other thing I just thought of too to share with people is that uh, one of the primary symptoms other than smelling the anal glands that people will see if their dogs are having anal gland issues is scooting. Mm -hmm. So either scooting their butt along the ground or you know along the floor uh, or turning back and licking often at the hind end. 
And so if they're looking at the rectum a lot or they're scooting or people are smelling, uh, you know, that, that horrid smell, then that's where we recommend to check their anal glands and see if they're having an issue. Mm -hmm. Very good. <laughs> We're covering every topic here today <laughs> from, from nose to tail. Uh, so here's another question that comes in from Nicole. She says, another question about arthritis um, and degenerative disc disease. How much exercise do you think is okay? My daughter wants to compete in obedience. So I'm starting her with stump and he's getting two week walks a day when I, when I can totaling 20 to 30 minutes. Any essential oils I should couple with at home in addition to your treatment? I'm supplementing more to his diet like we've discussed already in our course. Okay. So arthritis and degenerative disc disease, uh, it's really variable for how much exercise, if they, if they already have those issues. If they're not symptomatic, so if they're not in pain and they're not limping, you know, Honestly, I, I don't know that you necessarily need to limit the exercise. Uh, it, it really depends on how they respond to that exercise and their history. So it's a little bit hard, I guess, to give a, a you know a blanket recommendation, but um, definitely tailor it to to their response. So um, you know, if if heavy exercise or long term exercise ends up with them, you know, paying for it a little bit later and they're in pain or, or if it's causing any kind of lameness or, um, you know, less of an ability to, you know, get up and down easily and things like that, then I would definitely tailor it to uh, what is working for them. But there are certainly a lot of dogs that have had a history of degenerative uh, disc disease that, that are not symptomatic, you know, for uh, at all afterwards or, Inter intermittently. So, you know, I would always tailor it to each individual patient's needs. The other thing that I would recommend if you have access to in your area would be chiropractic care. Mm -hmm. That can be a tremendous asset for, you know, any kind of musculoskeletal issues. Uh, and acupuncture can be very obviously useful as well. So that would be another great option. Mm -hmm. um, typical things to uh, recommend for arthritis or degenerative disc disease would be things that are helpful for joint support. So food medicine, again, some of the things that I would make sure you're doing for your doggy is bone broth. Exactly. Bone broth is a phenomenal food medicine option for arthritis and keeping the musculoskeletal system very healthy actually not only helps joints and of course cartilage, but tendons and ligaments as well and helps keep the muscles strong. So bone broth helps prevent muscle atrophy. And then an omega-3 uh, fatty acid source would be great too. So whether that's a really quality fish oil or feeding sardines and you know anchovies and things on a regular basis, omega-3s and bone broth are fantastic for uh, arthritis uh, you know, prevention and treatment. So, and yet again, as you said at the top, Dr. Kangas, this totally applies to humans as well. So many of us have joint and, you know, structural issues of that. Yeah, nature. absolutely. And so hopefully I answered that. Okay. The 20 to 30 minutes sounds really great. As long as your doggy responds well to that, and that's not, you know, too much for them. Uh, you can always tailor, you know, how, uh, with the exercise, you can look at, uh, limiting the time, but you can also look at limiting how, uh, you know, how rambunctious the activity is too. So whether it's just leash walking does great for your doggy, but if they, you know, run and play and, and, you know, wrestle and things like that, that might be too much. So you can look at kind of the type of exercise and then also uh, the amount or the, you know, time that they're exercising. So the, the other thing that I, that I would like to bring up too, is they've actually done studies as far as older arthritic dogs. Uh, a lot of people, if you, especially if you have multiple dogs in your home, you may leave your older pet that it's hard for them to, to get around, especially when you're walking multiple dogs and your uh, younger dogs are, are faster and more agile that the, some, you know, households or families, you may end up leaving the older dog uh, to just hang out at home while you're out on a walk and just let them out to go potty. It has been, you know, definitely established that 
the, with movement and blood flow, arthritis symptoms actually improve and get better. Uh, so it is important to remember or recognize that a little bit of movement, short, you know, easygoing walks for anybody with significant arthritis is actually going to be more helpful than being sedentary all the time and just perhaps going out to go potty and come back in. Mm -hmm. So if, if you do have a situation where it's hard to walk multiple dogs at once, you may want to actually invest the time in a couple of different walks so you can do faster walks with the younger doggies and a nice, slow, easy paced walk with uh, an older or arthritic pet. And that way the blood flow is really going to help them and they'll end up being less stiff with less symptoms if they can get out a couple times a day. And once or twice a day for at least 10 minutes is a really nice mark. They've actually done some studies on that. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Um, great. So I want to just welcome those that are jumping on the line now. We just had several add in. So I want to welcome you. This is Dr. Kangas, an amazing holistic vet from here in San Diego and a uh, regular in our, on our show. At least once a month, we're doing stuff here together and learning on different topics. But today, our topic is open. We wanted to give the floor to all of you to get your questions answered. And I just love it. I've always loved q and I was telling Dr. Kangas even before we started that this is what I do with Deepak all the time. I'll host the calls and field all the questions in for all of our training programs. And they're always my favorite conversations because it's fun to jump from topic to topic and hear what's going on with people. And we get all kinds of little pieces of info that we would have never even thought to ask, like you just shared with us. So really great. Um, so welcome to everybody who's just jumped on. We've got Kate and Annette and Gail who's joined us here. Uh, so let's take, actually, let's pull up Gail's question. Uh, can acupressure decrease lipomas? If so, how often do you do it per week and for how long? Um, you know, I have not seen clinical response with that. Um, lipomas, for anybody who doesn't know, is, a, is basically a benign fatty tumor. So a collection of, uh, you know, a little lump of fat super common in lots of different dogs and, you know, more so as they age, but uh, there are a lot of dogs, especially, you know, Labradors are known for it, but really so many breeds of having multiple or numerous lipomas on their body. Uh, most veterinarians, I think in general, consider that a, a fairly, if they're small, a fairly low priority um, as far as, you know, surgically removing them and things like that can be done. Some lipomas can get very large and at times perhaps interfere with movement if they're in the armpit or the axillary area uh, or on the chest right near right near a limb. Um, if they get really, really large or, or if they're starting to get large, I should say, I, I do recommend to um, or sometimes recommend to surgically remove them depending on the patient's situation. Um, but for the most part, having them on a healthy diet. There are some acupuncture techniques to address this, um, but I haven't seen a lot of uh, lipoma shrink, but I have seen them at least not get bigger, you know, keep them static in their size. So acupressure, there's never a downside to doing it. So I absolutely would support doing that. Um, let's see if so, how often per week and how long. I would say with acupressure, you know, a few minutes would be great. I mean, even several seconds to a few minutes. Usually when we do acupuncture, the needles are staying in for, you know, 10 to 20 minutes. With acupressure, you can massage over those points. I mean, even several seconds to a few minutes is still going to be beneficial. More than that might be a little bit, you know, uh, difficult to achieve and, and, you know, possibly a little bit excess for some animals. Um, but really, a few minutes would be would be great and wouldn't be too long. Um, and there's no downside to it, it can definitely uh, support a lot, you can do a lot of things with uh, acupressure. So I would recommend it. Yeah. Great. And right along those lines, Dr. Kangas, we had a, a written in question from Roseanne that said, what type of lumps or bumps on our dogs should we be concerned with and have looked at? My dog has many. Uh, and then I, if your dog has many, I would get them looked at. It's re or even more than looked at. I mean, that's the thing is it's very difficult other than lipomas. And, and even with lipomas, we can't be 100% certain. But lipomas have a very specific uh, particular texture and oftentimes locations that can be typical. Uh, but 
there are so many lumps and bumps that we have no idea what they are from visually inspecting them. And so we really have to, you know, counsel people in the uh, the best option to get any kind of a, a diagnosis or even a presumptive diagnosis is to do a fine needle aspirate and cytology. And that's where we actually take a needle and syringe and you know insert that into the lump and draw back and try and get some of the cellular material to uh, you know come out into the into the sample and then that is sent to the lab for a pathologist to review and generally most of the time they can give you uh, an answer as to what that is it's not always conclusive because sometimes cells don't exfoliate and, and come out of the lump and uh, we don't get perhaps a representative sample on a slide. But um, generally the cytology is rewarding. It will give you an answer or at least a um, you know presumptive uh, guesstimate as to what that is. And then depending on if it's benign or if it's aggressive or has a tendency to be malignant, what kind of uh, mass that is or tumor that is, then we can make an appropriate recommendation on whether that can be, you know, monitored or whether it should be surgically removed and something more uh, assertive done about it. And the the nice thing about doing a fine needle aspirate in cytology also and getting getting these, you know, more um, accurate results or detailed results is determining whether or not we need to be more aggressive in surgical removal. So if it's something that can be you know, locally invasive, but doesn't metastasize, or if it's something that's benign, that helps the veterinarian or the surgeon determine if we need wide margins or, you know, if we can be less assertive with our removal, or if we could just perhaps leave it and monitor it. Mm -hmm. So, but lumps can look that, you know, and they were taught, you know, by the oncologist, mast cell tumors can look like anything. They can look like nothing much. Um, one of the things that usually is easy to determine that it is benign is something like a sebaceous cyst or um, an epidermal uh, kind of like a wart, you know, they look like warts or cysts, like epidermal cysts. Those have a very characteristic look that, that are benign. Sebaceous cysts can have this, you know, sebaceous gland material that collects in it. And sometimes they actually, um, you know, rupture open and this thick white pasty material comes out. Sometimes they get irritated and they can get a little bloody or scabby on the top. Those are generally all benign, those types of things. So there may be, you know, lots of veterinarians that would look at something like that and go, you know, don't worry about it. I'm pretty confident that, that that's not an issue. Could be removed. It's a cosmetic, you know, it can be a cosmetic issue. But um, there are a lot of other lumps that we cannot tell uh, what it is without testing it. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just just watching every lump, um, you know, is de is definitely going to be a potential risk, depending on you know, mm -hmm. on what they look like. But going on. yeah, mm -hmm. super interesting. I I absolutely love all the questions and answers, and I love obviously I'm not alone. We have many questions and comments that have come through. So thank you again. We'll take just one um, more of your questions before we wrap it up for today. And then of course, we'll always be back for more. So let's take a next question here. My Bella does not come into heat. Just wondering why this would be and should I still have her desex? Wow. Uh, so I would assume that you know for sure that she has not been uh, spayed already. Um, Good point, like, right? If through yeah. the shelter system, sometimes you don't know. Yeah, I, so I don't know if you got Bella as a as a tiny little puppy, or if you got her uh, as an you know as an adolescent or an older doggy. And sometimes the history is not accurate. I mean, sometimes people are told that the pet was spayed and it's not, or vice versa. So that's the first thing I would do. There are some hormonal tests to check to see if the ovaries are still present. So that's that's what I would do actually is talk to your veterinarian about doing uh, you know a hormone test to see if it appears that she is indeed spayed or not, and if she you know has mm -hmm. her ovaries or not. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, I, I don't know, you know, we don't know her age, so it's a little bit hard to say. Generally, most small breed dogs are going to go into heat about twice a year. 
And large breed dogs, maybe a little bit less often, maybe they go into heat every seven to nine months, as opposed to every, you know, average of six months for smaller breeds. Um, so, but that, that is unusual. So I don't know why that would be the case other than maybe the history being inaccurate, uh, but it would be good to, to get that investigated. And that did uh, just comment back here. She said she did get her as a puppy. So Wow. Wow. And how old is she now? Um, doesn't say, let's see if she'll write that into us. And that, yeah, let us know that. So take a minute probably to come through. All right. Well, that is interesting. I've not heard of such a thing. So, you know, you never know the bodies, right? Human and dog bodies and every animal. Uh, it's everyone's different and unique. And sometimes there's these rare cases. Oh, here she is. She's four years old. Bella. Wow. Okay. So here's the other thing is if she's tiny, I, I mean, it, it is possible that she's come into heat and you don't know it. Mm -hmm. That is possible too. I mean, there are small breed dogs that, uh, you know, don't bleed very much. Usually though, you know, their, their vulva, the genital, you know, opening will um, enlarge a little bit. So sometimes people can tell their dogs in heat from, from that. But I mean, you know, everybody's different and it's, it's possible that maybe your doggy did go into heat and she just didn't have any obvious external symptoms for you to, to notice. So that's another possibility in the, you know, in the scenario. Very interesting. Well, Dr. Kangas, I think we'll wrap it up with that one. And you just, again, what a wealth of knowledge uh, for anyone watching. Like I mentioned at the top of the hour is we do this every second Saturday of every month with Dr. Kangas, this open kind of usually on a topic, but sometimes the Q and A topic like this. And so just be sure to mark your calendars and join us. We love having you all, all on live. We get into all kinds of details in the course, the total wellbeing for dogs course, as I mentioned, mentioned. And if you enjoy this conversation, you want to learn more, you will learn, if anything, maybe too much information <laughs> in the course, because I just love to share it all. And um, there's so much goodness. So we'll do this course again in October. If you're interested, um, you can go to samadog.com and just get on the newsletter, get on the mailing list. And then you'll, of course, be informed when the time comes up again. And, and we'd love to have you along. Thank you, Dr. Kangas, again, for giving us your time and all of your knowledge. Super interesting. Obviously, people love this one so we'll certainly do this this open format again if you're okay with it and thank you again for being here with us thank you so much for having me my pleasure mm -hmm. well thank you all have a wonderful rest of your weekend everybody saying thanks and uh, bella is a maltese by the way so now we know she is a little girl mm -hmm. so um yeah everybody's just dumping in their thanks and they loved this session so wonderful to connect with you all and we will see you next time namaste thank have a you. Great weekend. thank you